It is our pleasure to be joined by a former Texas Longhorn running back. He's a Texas great. Also spent a long time in the National Football League. Fozzie Whitaker is in the house. I forgot Longhorn Network, man. Dang it. That's my bad. Longhorn <laughs> Network also. What's up, Foz? What is going on, fellas, man? I appreciate you all having me on. How about this? This is the first time these two teams have been ranked 5-0 and since 2011. Gabe, you and I were there. How about that? How crazy is that? R remind me, how'd that one go? We won't talk about the score, <laughs> but I did <laughs> score. I will say that I did score. You did. We won't talk about the overall score. <laughs> now, let's start there, Foz, right? We've got, you know, Texas coming into this one, arguably the best team in the country. OU playing much better football than they did a year ago, right? Really good football team. I mean, how cool is it that this game feels... I don't know, as big as it does, as it, it feels big like it should, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I'm reminded of the 2008 season. Obviously, both teams were undefeated. Both teams were ranked in the top five back in 2008. But it was like a for sure showcase of whoever won that game was most likely going to go play and compete for a, a national championship. And obviously, Texas won but didn't play for the national championship. Oklahoma went on and played for the national championship against that Florida team. But both of those teams were truly special in and of themselves and had truly special seasons. I think this game has the culmination and the makings of that type of atmosphere and environment around the fairgrounds. Obviously, both of these teams being ranked in the top 12, both undefeated have great teams, right? The defense is playing lights out for both of the teams. Offense is playing lights out. Both quarterbacks look really good. It'll be a nice duel to see both of them go head to head for the first time and healthy because uh, that was the issue last year. But ultimately, uh, it, it has the makings of whichever team comes out on top of this game most likely goes on to win the Big 12 and compete in the CFP and, and possibly can play, compete and play for a national championship. What's been the difference, you know, just big picture uh, under Sark? I mean, you guys have always recruited well. The roster's always had a bunch of really talented guys. Mm -hmm. What's different under Sarkeesian that's got this thing to really, it feels like, all come together at the right time? I think ultimately it stems down to what he's done in the trenches. And I know both of you guys can appreciate this, but Sarkeesian and the development and the recruiting talent that he's brought in at the offensive line position has been an unbelievable transformation. This is year number three for Steve Sarkeesian, and I don't know if I could have predicted the success at the offensive line position that he's had. And some of the guys that he inherited, he's made into much better offensive linemen. I'm talking about Christian Jones in particular. Kyle Flood has done a phenomenal job being able to develop him. He was a left tackle, struggled at being a left tackle, moved him to right tackle, had a phenomenal season last year, and this year is picking up right where he left off. Brought in five-star DJ Campbell, brought in five-star high four-star Kelvin Banks Jr., who was a freshman All-American a season ago. Cole Hudson, another young guy that came in, played a lot. Hayden Connor was another younger guy that hadn't had much reps prior to Sarkeesian implementing him into that starting role. Uh, and man, you have a formidable five, six offensive lineman that can go into rotation and absolutely compete against some of the best D lines across the country. And where that really hit home for me was in the first two weeks of the season. And it was kind of weird because Rice was able to get pressure and force three sacks against that Texas offensive lineman. I don't know if it was the jitters or whatever it was, but it was the same starting five from a season ago. And Rice did some things defensively from a schematic standpoint that they hadn't necessarily showed on film. You got seven, eight months to prepare for your season opener. So they did a few different things that, that put that Texas O-line on their heels but then you come back the very next week playing Tuscaloosa. Don't have a procedural penalty with 100,000 fans. So no false starts, none of those pre-snap penalties. And then did not give up one sack to that vaunted defensive line at Alabama. And I think that was truly the turning point of where the development of why this team looks different underneath Sark is because he's been able to put an investment in the offensive line that Texas has not seen since the 2005, 2004, 
Rose Bowl and national championship Texas team that put multiple offensive linemen into the NFL draft. I mean, since that time, Texas has had Sam Cosme and Connor Williams as Texas O-linemen that have been drafted and drafted fairly highly as both of those guys win the second round. Since then, it's been a drought. And so that's where Texas is starting to flip the script. And Steve Sarkeesian has been at the forefront with the level of talent and the size of the human beings that he's been able to recruit up front in the O-line. Big humans. It's always good to have big humans. I say it all the time, Foz. <laughs> now, looking at this offense for the Longhorns, how much improvement have you seen from Quinn Ewers? What, what's really stood out about him this season to you? Yeah, Quinn has been really special this year. One thing that obviously stands out, if you're just looking at the superficial statistics, he hasn't thrown interceptions, right? He threw his first one against Kansas right at the end of the second quarter, trying to push it, get points going into halftime. That was his first pick. He's thrown nine touchdowns to that one interception, but all four games prior to Kansas this past weekend, He's been clean as as far as taking care of the football, creating opportunities for his receivers to make plays, and then understanding, hey, if the receiver's not open and if my check down's not there, I'm going to go ahead and tuck it and I'm going to run and go get me some yardage or possibly score a touchdown. And he has four rushing touchdowns on the season to date as of now. Puts him on place. I know weird stat. Don't even actually take anything of this but puts him on pace right now to have more rushing touchdowns in a season than Vince Young did back in 2005 right that's crazy right he's no Vince Young that is that is crazy to think about it's like ah right. uh, Ewers Vince oh, Young but oh, right. uh, dude I'll give him credit yes the the one against Kansas right early mm-hmm. I mean he looks he doesn't look slow. <laughs> you can't just play man man coverage and yeah. turn your back to him and not Absolutely. even think about it. Absolutely. The, the, the craziest thing, is, and once you all go back, after I say this, you all look at it and laugh. The craziest thing is almost every Russian touchdown that he's had, he tries to kick it into like an extra gear and like almost has a, like a mini stumble <laughs> and like he catches his balance and like finishes the run. He did it against Baylor where he breaks off the the 29 yarder, but like stumbles halfway before he like gets into the end zone. He did it against Kansas trying to run the bootleg and like the defensive line is trying to chase after him. His very first rushing touchdown off the zone read beginning of the season against rice. He like stumbles going into the end zone. So I'm not quite sure what's going on with the stumble thing that he has going on, but it, it's worked for him, obviously, and it's kept this offense on track as far as staying ahead of the sticks and obviously putting up points. But uh, along with him utilizing his legs, the leadership capabilities that he's been able to become, that that vocal leader as well as that passionate leader and the one that's showcasing himself on the field, he's playing with a lot more confidence and a lot more freedom uh, and is starting to show in his game. Last year, uh, this was a guy that was still learning plays on the go, This was a guy that was still getting nervous as his first time being a true starter. And this was a guy that was getting confused by a lot of of what the defense was was giving him, especially on pre-snap plays or if they were disguising coverages. Uh, he, he was, he was lost. The game was moving too fast for him this year. I see him more comfortable and confident in the pocket. I see him taking the strides in the off season to become that vocal leader. You don't have Roshan Johnson being there to, to talk everybody up. You don't have B. John Robinson to be able to rely on whenever it's third and seven. Okay. Let me just get it to him. He'll find a way to go get eight yards. You don't have that anymore. So now Quinn has had to be thrust into that role and he's accepted it. He's changed his body type. He's cut off his beard. He's cut off his mullet. Uh, he, he's cut out Chick-fil-A. I don't know how you can do that. Chick-fil-A? You cut out Chick-fil-A? That's that's a man that's possessed right now. Uh, and he's playing like it. But uh, it, it's obviously equated to him being a, a different person, feeling more confident about himself. And, and that's been able to, to show and the development that he's been able to create in the chemistry with his receivers uh, week in and week out so far. Yeah, it's it's a great receiving core. Really, all the skill guys, um, you know, whenever you put everyone together, it's a really talented group. Um, Jatavian Sanders, you know, may be the, the most difficult matchup of everyone. Uh, what's the update you think on him? Do you think he's going to try and go? How bad was that ankle? And like, what is it about him in that offense that they've been able to really create some mismatches and get him the ball and, and uh, take advantage of some people? 
Yeah, Jatavian Sanders is an unbelievable athlete. How about I got another nugget for you all. Jatavian Sanders has had two 100-yard games. Can you all name the last tight end to have two 100-yard games in a Big 12 season? Mark Andrews? There he is. Mark Andrews, wow. Mark Andrews. So Jatavian Sanders is putting up Mark Andrews-type numbers uh, with what he's been able to do. Now, at the same time, Jatavian Sanders, you talked about it, the injury that he had, the, the ankle sprain, the high ankle sprain. Uh, Sark talked about it on Monday. He's listed as day-to-day. Uh, he's going to have a better update of where Jatavian Sanders is on tomorrow. So hopefully in his press conference, we get a little bit more insight because obviously that makes a huge difference on, on what Oklahoma does in order to prepare for what type of offense they expect to see. Jatavian Sanders is a mismatch nightmare, right? Do you put a safety on him? Uh, I don't know. Some safeties can't run as fast as he can. Do you put a corner on him? Corners usually aren't big enough to be able to defend him. Do you put a linebacker on him? Now, Jatavian Sanders will run circles around most linebackers in the college landscape right now. So it really makes it hard to be able to defend a guy like him, at least from a one-on-one perspective. And then if you try to bracket him, well, you still got guys like Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell on the outside that can make you pay, especially on one-on-one deep ball shot. So it, it makes it a tough matchup, but if he's not there and he, if he's not healthy enough to go, which in my mind, I think if there was one game, he'd be able to, to try to play it, it'd be this one for sure. Wrap it up, get, get whatever pills you got to take, whatever shots you got to get, right. You, you got to be able to, to, to be as effective as possible because you bring something different to the table that not everybody else on the roster can do. Gunner Ham and no offense to Gunner Ham. He's not Jatavian Sanders. He doesn't provide the same mismatches that Jatavian Sanders brings to the table. And so if you have a healthy Jatavian Sanders or at least 80 percent Jatavian Sanders, that still provides that that idea that, OK, this guy, if, if you forget about him, he'll still make you pay in a big way. So um, we'll see what that update is from Coach Sark on, on tomorrow, if, if that'll be something that uh, will allow him to be able to play through and fight through. Uh, but at the same time, man, his value and his presence is, is one that is felt and obviously utilized in a big way as he's had two 100-yard games so far this season and, and Quinn Ewer's kind of security blanket whenever he needs to find that go-to guy on third down. If if he plays, that dude is a mutant because that oh. clip of him getting rolled up, oh, my uh. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it's, it's amazing that the only thing that came out of that, at least what we were told, was it was an ankle sprain. And I was like, wait a minute. A dude just came out with a hurt ankle? Like, his knee was not – like mutilated <laughs> or like, hey, you know, not, like, not all athletes are created equal Foz. Yeah, that guy uh <laughs> that guy's a special athlete now uh, kind of wrapping up the offense for the longhorns the running back situation mm -hmm. obviously i know you you're watching that position closely all the time for texas jonathan brooks he's he's emerged as the guy like what what have you seen from that group as a whole you know, it's been interesting because Jonathan Brooks ha has taken the reins and, and really run away with it in his performances over the past couple of weeks. But uh, the, the mindset that Jonathan Brooks had to have, right, whenever you come into the season, you're already thinking, OK, no Bijan, he's playing for the Falcons. No Roshan, he's playing for the Bears. I've been behind these guys for two seasons, like in any time that they were out of the game a season ago. I usually came in, I did well, also produce at a, at a high level whenever I had my opportunities. You look at it, you're like, okay, I'm probably going to be the starter coming into the season. And lo and behold, Rice comes around week number one, and C.J. Baxter is the one that gets the start, who's the five-star, highly talented running back out of Florida. Don't get me wrong, C.J. Baxter is a really good back. But Jonathan Brooks probably felt slighted in some sort of way that he wasn't the guy off rip because of what he had been able to show the past two seasons. And then having just that older kind of mindset about being the, the, the most senior running back within the room with the opportunity to be in every down back, right? Keelan Robinson's the oldest, but Jonathan Brooks probably is, is viewed as the every down back. If you think about how Steve Sarkeesian likes to run his offense. So I bet he felt a little bit slighted from the way that he was, uh, I guess, treated or utilized within that first week in preparation against Rice. And then obviously C.J. Baxter goes down. Jonathan Brooks steps in. 
uh, against Rice and then plays against Alabama and then boom, he's off to the races, Wyoming, Baylor, Kansas, this dude put hundred yards, hundred yards, and then 200 yards stacking them back to back to back. And man, he's on pace to have one of the Deontay Foreman type seasons, Deontay Foreman, his last year, he rushed for, I want to say through four games, he had rushed for almost 600 yards uh, and ended up finishing over 2000 yards over the course of that 2018 season. Jonathan Brooks' pace is right on par with what Deontay Foreman was doing and a slightly average higher than what Bijan did a year ago, which is insane to say that because nobody had the expectations for a guy like Jonathan Brooks to be able to produce on this level. The, the, that was going to be the big question mark of who's going to replace that type of production and talent that they had at the running back position. And I think Jonathan Brooks has answered that in a, in a major way. Uh, but it's not only him. C.J. Baxter's done a phenomenal job stepping in, getting some good carries as a true freshman. Jaden Blue, he's come in, showed some flashes as well. He's a lot more shifty. Savion Red, another guy that gets minimal carries but makes a major impact. I mean, Texas might not win that Wyoming game in the way that they want it if they didn't have Savion Red in that Wildcat formation converting on two fourth downs uh, late in the game to be able to extend the drive. Um, so you got guys like that. And then Keelan Robinson, like I mentioned, he's the all everything. He comes in, he pass pros, he's out in the receivers. Uh, he's returning kicks. He's blocking kicks. He's on every special teams. Uh, he's kind of the, the new age Roshan Johnson of what Roshan did a season ago. Uh, just maybe not as big, but is definitely faster. So uh, the utilization of all the running backs in general, man, they, they've been utilized very well. Uh, spearheaded by the performances that Jonathan Brooks has been able to put together week after week on a consistent basis. How about defensively? What what stood out to you uh, so far this season for, for Texas? And what do you think perhaps the game plan is going to be to slow down Dylan Gabriel? You know, the, the biggest thing that stood out to me was how was this defensive line going to be? You lose two fifth year seniors that was all everything with them snacks adrian uh i mean keandre colburn as well as uh moro ojimo they, they're both playing in the nfl right now but they were a major part of the success that texas had faced a season ago and number one stopping the run and also getting after the passer tavondre sweat has been there for some years byron murphy's been there for a couple of years as well but they hadn't necessarily proven that they can be kind of your, your every down or every first, second down type of rotational players from a first quarter through fourth quarter consistent basis. Uh, and I think they've had a really big impact on why Texas's defense looks the way that it looks right now, uh, along with Vernon Broughton and Alfred Collins coming on very strong. That D line has picked up where they left off, even though they've lost a lot of talent a season ago. They've picked up where they left off and been able to provide a, a really good boost to where this Texas front can be. Uh, and then you you implement some newer faces into there. You, Ethan Burke, first year starting uh, as that weak side DN, uh, has created a couple sacks and some TFLs and, and probably wasn't expected. He doesn't look the most athletically gifted. But whenever he steps on the field, he produces as if he he's he he has his hair on fire. Uh, you look at Anthony Hill Jr., uh, another young guy, true freshman uh, from the Den Ryan, that's been able to make plays week in and week out, and playing in kind of the most valuable moments of a game. I mean, he's in there whenever Texas is deadlocked with Alabama in week number two, as a true freshman making plays, and he he gets a, a critical sack against Jalen Milrow that helped seal the deal for that game, but. He's in there whenever the game is on the line, and that goes to show you the type of trust that Sark and the defensive coordinator Pete Kukowski has in a guy like him uh, and, and utilizing what those two do well along with a, a combination and mixture of a lot of guys rolling in, creating depth on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, this defense ha has been pleasantly surprising uh, in, in creating takeaways and being able to apply pressure on the quarterback. With that being said, Dylan Gabriel provides a completely different monster than this Texas defense has seen, right? They saw a running threat with Jalen Milrow. They saw a little bit of a running threat in Jason Bean as well. 
But Dylan Gabriel, whenever he escapes out of the pocket, he's not necessarily looking to run unless he has to. He keeps his he keeps his eyes downfield and creates for an opportunity to be able to get Drake Stoops or Jaleel Farouk or Nick Anderson back at the end zone for a touchdown. And that's something that Texas hasn't necessarily seen a veteran style quarterback that can do it all. Dylan Gabriel has been playing, in my opinion, at the top of his game, right? He leads the conference in almost every statistical category, 15 touchdowns, two interceptions, also added in some rushing touchdowns as well. Uh, he's been really confident. A bad game, in my opinion, for Dylan Gabriel is having eight incompletions, right? He, If he has eight incompletions, everybody's like, man, what's going on, right? We're, we need to see Jackson Arnold. Uh, but that just goes to show you uh, the testament of him being able to be in combination and lockstep with what Coach Levy wants to be able to call. That tempo, that's a real thing, right? Texas hasn't faced uh, an offense that runs the tempo-style offense in the way that Oklahoma does. And it's been a staple at Oklahoma, right? You get up on them real quick and then five seconds later you're back on the ball running another play and trying to find the subs on the defensive side of the ball creates mismatch opportunities it also creates penalties uh and, and it's really tough to defend and you can't really simulate that in practice because nobody really goes that fast the only two teams typically that play like that is oregon and oklahoma or at least who have success playing like that is oregon and oklahoma and so you don't see it regularly, and that's something that this Texas defense has to prepare for. But you have to always keep a spy on Dylan Gabriel because, like I said, he will hurt you with his legs. Uh, and then at the same time, you got to make him uncomfortable in the pocket. And that's something that Sark talks about is having fanatical effort. If he turns on the tape, and, and for the defensive side in particular, if somebody isn't giving great effort, they talk about it after every single game. He said that's the first thing they do in team meeting is turn on the tape and they point out, guys that gave fanatical effort and guys that didn't before they even talk about the X's and O's. So that's something that you're going to have to have whenever you're playing against a guy that can create and make plays and scramble in the pocket the way that Dylan Gabriel does. Um, you got to have integrity in the rush lanes to be able to try to collapse the pocket on top of them. Uh, but at the end of the day, I expect Dylan Gabriel to get his. Um, and honestly, it's going to come down to the team that, that commits the least amount of turnovers, who makes the least amount of mistakes. And, and right now, both of these defenses are really good at taking the ball away with Oklahoma, I believe, having 10 interceptions, which leads the league uh, in Texas. I want to say it's, it's at seven interceptions, uh, which is at top three in the league uh, and, and, and takeaways. So these two teams on, on defensive side know how to turn the ball over and, and force those turnovers which one is going to be the one that can do it on a consistent basis or whenever the game is on the line, that's the one that will probably come out on top. All right, Foz. How do you see this one going, man? You know, it's very tricky. And, and I know, Gabe, you and I talked about this uh, uh, the other day, too. It was like back in 2009, we saw high-powered offenses between both of them probably expectations was the game was going to be similar to, to what it was in 2008, where it was a 45, 35 shootout going back and forth between the two teams. And it was a 16 to 13 game. It was like, wait a minute, we got two top five offenses in the country and only what 29 points were scored between the two. Like, how is that even a thing? Uh, I don't expect that to be the case this time. Both defenses are playing lights out. Uh, but I think, each offense provides something unique and peculiar about themselves that makes this a high scoring game. I believe Texas, if I put a score on it, probably will win 38 to 34. Uh, I, I think it's one of those close matchups before last year, the previous eight red river rivalry games were decided by eight points or less. And last year was an anomaly. We know Dylan Gabriel not being able to play, we, we kind of throw that out from a standpoint of, of what this game actually means and has been in the history of the rivalry between these two teams. But over the before that, eight years straight, it was decided by eight points or less. So I think it gets more back in alignment with that close style game. And, and my score at the moment probably is a 38-34 victory for Texas in this one. Well, I hope you're wrong. <laughs> Foz, hey man it's all it's always fun catching up it's the most wonderful week of the year man appreciate you absolutely fellas i appreciate y'all having me on man enjoy yourselves in dallas as well oh you know we will <laughs>